It took the Earth 200 million years to compress plant and animal matter to create fossil fuels. And we have almost used it all up in a little over 200 years. Opinions vary on when fossil fuels will run out. But we know we are close. This is why we need a green economy. A green economy provides for everyone's needs, is resource efficient, does not pollute, and is sustainable. To build this economy for social equity and prosperity, we need to empower aspiring inventors and entrepreneurs. GBiz is a competition to conjure up a host of new ideas and business plans to drive the green economy. Giving bright minds the opportunity to present. I have this in yard. What's the green one? It's a Nations Conference on Sustainable Development in Rio de Janeiro, June 2012. I'm the delegate Okay, let's everyone sit down and uh, this is where Peace Child International tears apart the United Nations and does things the way that we like to do them. Uh, whoever designed this building as a conference room did not have the first clue about conferring because this is rather more in the style of the furnishings of the Nuremberg rallies where you sit down there and we hector you. And that's not what we want to do. As I said at the beginning, we want to hear what your ideas are on this important question of the round table which is, what can the UN do to partner with and support young green entrepreneurs? And also, we'd be interested in your answers to the question about why you think the green economy is important. And we have five very distinguished people up here who are going to very briefly tell you their answers to those questions, and then they're going to come down amongst you and uh, listen to what your ideas are. So we're going to split into small groups, turn the, table, uh, the chairs around a little and sit on the backs of tables and so on, and we're going to talk in small groups about these questions. So the question we're looking at is what can the UN do to support and partner with young green entrepreneurs? And the answer may be nothing. But the answer should not be nothing because this is the world's leading gathering place. And although I, um, over 30 years, increasingly worried and disillusioned and concerned about the failure of the United Nations to lead us towards solutions to climate change, towards sustainable development. That is not a reason to give up on it. One of the most wonderful supporters of uh, the United Nations, a gentleman called Ralph Bunch, who has a park across the street here, he was amazingly critical of the UN. And we should be too. We should not accept the way the UN is at the moment. And that's why we're asking for your ideas to send to Ahmed this new uh, envoy to youth, to show that young people really want to shake up this building and get some solutions. They betrayed us. They failed us in Copenhagen. They failed us at Rio Plus 20 last year. They failed us again in Doha. We've got to kick some butt here and get, get some things moving. So no pressure, but let's hear what these people have to say about what the UN can do. And I'd like to start by introducing uh, Vincent, Vincius Pinero, who is the Deputy Director of the uh, International Labor Organization here in New York. <coughs> And he will speak both to this issue and another issue of great concern to youth, youth unemployment. Vincius. Uh, thank you very much, David. Uh, good morning, um, everyone. So, um, to address this question of how the UN can support uh, young entrepreneurs, I'll just make three points. First, let me say that the transition to a green economy will destroy jobs. Let's be absolutely frank on that but we also transform jobs and create new jobs. The net impact on job creation is likely to be positive if the right 
this is what policy, policies are in place. We have some studies in the ILO that show that, uh, that up to 60 million jobs can be, cre can be created in the transition. This is equivalent to 2% of the global uh, total employment. But there will be no gains without policies oriented to promoting uh, sustainable business production, production and it, it's, it was very interesting in the panel this morning that showed some concrete example, examples on that. And also uh, supporting small and uh, medium-sized enterprises and entrepreneurship. Second, uh, to promote social protection floors and adapt skills training policies to the transition in order to smooth the, the impact of transition people and also empower people to seize the opportunities of the, of the new opportunities that are going to be created. The role of labor standards are, are fundamental because uh, it can serve as a practical guide uh, to, to work towards a green and sustainable economy, especially when it comes to uh, job quality and occupation and safety and health issues. And finally, social dialogue. Social dialogue between governments, between workers, between employers, between youth associations, between civil society, to ensure a sustainable uh, governance uh, framework. Well, my second point is exactly on youth. Every year, there are around 40 million people like you that are getting, that are joining into the labor force. This is pure population dynamics. So it's it's, it's a, 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 an avoidable truth. Around 30% of these people will be unemployed in the developed world. In some countries, for example Spain, one in each two people will be unemployed. This is the situation now, unfortunately. In developing economies, 60 or 70 percent will be working, but will be in the informal economy, or working with less, uh, with, uh, with a wage that is not necessary to, to overcome poverty. Of particular concern are those who are neither in employment nor in educational training, the famous needs. So, youth, young entrepreneurship, and business creation is indeed. Uh, a way to address this uh, situation of youth, youth unemployment. If you don't have a job, just create one. That's the, that's the deal. And this can happen um, uh, mostly in eight sectors that, I mean, that, will, that are closely relation, related with uh, environmental sustainability. Agriculture, forestry, fisheries, energy, resource-intensive manufacturing, recycling, buildings, and transport. These are the sectors that we are uh, working uh, very closely. And my third and final point that addresses exactly uh, the question how you can support uh, young green entrepreneurs, uh, I mean, to respond to this question, I would like to raise very concrete examples. Uh, and I'd like to refer, to refer to a work that is done by the, young, young, by the Youth Entrepreneurship Facility in partnership with the Africa Commission, uh, with the Youth Employment Network, and with the ILO uh, in Kenya, in three countries, Kenya, Uganda, in uh, Tanzania. And this program has been funded uh, initially by them. So basically there are six concrete measures that can be taken right away. First one is fundamental to foster a culture of entrepreneurship among young people. So this is the, the, the baseline. Introducing green entrepreneurship uh, uh, elements into uh, education in schools, especially at the secondary level. Ensuring access of potential and existing entrepreneurs to business development services. Enabling uh, access to finance. So this is, uh, this, uh, they should have access to, to credit, to micro credit facilities that would boost young entrepreneurship. Strengthening uh, youth led organizations. So this is very important for you through uh, ways like uh, uh, youth charity funds and other uh, measures uh, to, to provide incentives for, for, for strengthening these organizations and promoting, promoting advocacy work. We uh, evaluated this project recently, and there are some further concrete ideas, I mean, that could, put, uh, could, could be put forward in partnership uh, with, uh, with you and with business associations. First, it's fundamental to work through the already existing business associations by greening their business portfolio uh, and, and promoting other uh, measures to, to, to promote entrepreneurship. The outreach of these uh, well-established organizations is large, costs are low, and credibility and uptake of members are high. So we have to work through the already existing structures. Second, uh, it's fundamental to invest at the secondary school level. 
Sensitizing youth at the end of secondary school with, on green business opportunities seems to be the right age and the right moment to generate interest among future entrepreneurs. Greening a business plan competition and prices. I mean, this is uh, always a way to, to, to move forward. And there are many uh, already uh, available. Green training materials. I mean, there are many, there are, there are lots of interest by, uh, from, by schools and even business schools and business organizations in include uh, green elements in the, the curricula, but unfortunately, the, avail the availability of such materials is still scarce. Raise awareness, of course, uh, it's fundamental. Mentorship programs. Uh, it's also uh, uh, it's, it's a type of program that could combine uh, prices uh, and, and, and mentorship uh, uh, guidance to the, the, the youth. Grants to youth organizations, in particular in association with the private sector. And finally, and, and I think one of the most important uh, elements is by linking entrepreneurship in entrepreneurship with innovation, you know, with, you know, innovation problems, problems that, lead, that foster innovation. So these are some very concrete examples in which UN and I alone in particular can partner and establish partnerships with the private sector, with the business associations and youth associations to promote green entrepreneurship. Thank you so much, Vincius. <laughs> ILO is a great friend of youth. They held their first youth employment conference last year and I was there and it's really great to see them moving in our direction. Another important organization that's a recent development within the UN is the UN Global Compact. And Jed Fix is going to speak about uh, a program called PRME, Prime, which I think you started last year or the year before? It's been a few years now. We started in... Thank you. We, we started Prime, the Principles for Responsible Management Education, in 2007. So it is relatively young and it sits within the UN Global Compact, which is also fairly young, it started in 2000. I have a question for you. Who here has taken a business class? Raise your hands if you've taken a business class. Okay. Is anybody here in business school? Okay, just a few. Is anybody thinking about going to business school or hoping to go to business school? Is that it? Really? You're all here. You're interested in entrepreneurship. What Prime does is we work with business schools. So we're, we're the, the UN branch or the UN backed uh, initiative that, that partners with business schools around the world. So what we do is we, in this partnership, we ask business schools to embrace sustainability and embrace the values of corporate social responsibility. Uh, now, corporate social responsibility and sustainability mean different things to different people at different times in different places. We all know this. So what, what we've done is, being part of the Global Compact, we've really relied on their framework. What they've done is, is they've asked companies to, to think about the environmental aspects of their operations, but also to think about labor standards, to think about human rights, and to think about anti-corruption. So we've taken that and we've gone to business schools and, and we've said, we've offered the, an opportunity for business schools to engage in these areas. Um, we have 470 schools now who are committed at the highest level to including courses, to including workshops, to including research um, in, in these different areas of corporate social responsibility and the environment. Um, and what, what this means is, is that these, these schools are beginning to offer research opportunities for young people, but also research opportunities for their professors. It means that they're uh, incorporating um, green energy and, and entrepreneurship into their, their teaching. Uh, it means that they're um, you know, they're, they're offering uh, partnership opportunities with organizations like, uh, like this one. Uh, so that's a little bit about Prime. And right now we're working in 80 different countries. Uh, and like I said, we have 470 different schools that are part of it right now. We're trying to, to grow. Um, we're trying to 
become more of a presence in, in your different communities. So coming back to the, the question that was posed earlier is what can you do um, and what can we do? What can you do as, as young people interested in entrepreneurship and the green economy do to, uh, uh, to, to forward this goal? Uh, and I, w I would say, if your students that, uh, to look for opportunities in your educational institutions to, um, look, look for opportunities in your educational institutions to, en to engage on these themes, and, and then also to, to take courses in them. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Amy Rosen, who's been teaching entrepreneurship for a very, very long time, and following directly on from what Jed was saying, it is quite astonishing to me how few uh, MBA students, business students, have really got a clue about uh, sustainability, resource efficiency, the green economy. Uh, we, we did a trawl and found only one university in the world actually teaches courses on the green economy. So there's a lot of work to do to get the, the education right, and Amy's the person to tell us how to do that. Amy Rosen. Thank you. Um, so let me, start, um, let me start from where Jed did and ask you a slightly different version of his question, which is, how many of you have actually started a business or created a business plan for a business, green, purple, black, whatever? Great, got it. And how many of you have ever taken a class that had anything to do with managing money or creating business in your, before you got to college? I know we have some college students here, but in your post-secondary education. One, wow. That, I, I ask that question all over the world, and this is, this is more hands up than I almost ever see. <laughs> um, so, so you all are a unique group and have, uh, have some great advantages. And not to be, you know, not to open with being a controversial, um, opinionated person, which many will tell you I am, <laughs> I will also say that while um, I'm, I'm on the faculty at Columbia Business School and a great believer in um, an MBA education, I'm not convinced that all entrepreneurs are best served by going to business schools for just the reasons that um, they're talking about because much of the learning is actually not geared around business creation. Um, for my colleague on the ILL, I'll also just cite some other um, new data that, um, that I heard at Davos this past week that the ILL said, and it, you know, it, it's sad but not surprising, that we now have more than 200 million young people, 200 million um, young people under the age of 27 who are unemployed. And if you add other um, studies into that, and I'm sorry, we have more than, I'm sorry, we have 75 million, excuse me, um, young people who are unemployed. And if you add some other figures that we've seen um, widely spread recently, we've got another somewhere between um, 150 and 250 um, young people around the globe who are making less than $2 a day, so who are really the working poor. So it's pretty easy to get up to close to 300 million young people. And when we think about, you know, this generation is about a billion one worldwide, it's a frightening world out there um, and for, for many, many. And while we know that there's many job skills that are not being well matched, et cetera, we just also know that there's a huge gap in what are the projected number of gaps of jobs in there. Um, so, my name is Amy Rosen, and I'm the global president of an organization called the Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship, commonly known as NIFTI. And um, we believe that all young people can be entrepreneurial leaders, and our, our mission is really to um, create an opportunity for young people, all young people throughout the globe, to actually study entrepreneurship, to have the opportunity to learn the knowledge, skills, and um, expertise necessary to think entrepreneurially. Not that everyone's going to or should create their own business, not that everyone is going to or can create a green business, but that given, um, given the prospects out there, um, that is very early, early, very important early, not, um, not to wait until you're in college, um, but and particularly for young people from low-income communities that often don't have a wide vision of opportunity. We can, you know, we find that we can um, train public school teachers and incorporate it into your basic learning from, you know, 10 years old, as young as 10 years old up to 30, 
up to 20 years old, excuse me, that can actually, um, you can go through that experience and um, what results is really a, 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 an idea that most of you, because you're motivated to be here and have had lots of opportunity, already know, but the vast majority of young people, especially those growing up in poverty, don't know, that they can own their own future and that they can actually find their own path to prosperity if, if, if they get this concept that, that they're in charge and the, the path is theirs. So we were founded about 25 years ago, a few blocks from here up in the Bronx, um, by a, a teacher who was teaching in the South Bronx and having a terrible time keeping their kids interested in school. In the US, in many cities, we have more than 50% of kids of color dropping out of high school, and 85% of them say it's just not connected with anything relative to their lives. You know, and if you go into many schools worldwide, we're studying classical education, which is um, interesting and also looks just like the books that I read, which were not particularly relevant, and I'm old. Um, but, but so that um, he, Steve Mariotti is his name, started talking to kids about what he knew about business creation, business management, and um, particularly these young people who were from very, um, very limited resources. Um, suddenly saw an opportunity to make money, to, to find a path of whether it's, um, you know, social entrepreneur or um, other or green entrepreneurial businesses or whatever they were doing to actually follow their own dreams. Since then we've had um, 500,000 young people complete business plans, um, take this course. We've trained over more than, we've trained more than 5,000 teachers globally to teach this course. And, um, and interestingly, and on the subject that we're here to talk about today, we have a growing number of young people that are on their own um, creating business plans to support the green economy. So a couple of examples. Last year, our uh, national winner in the US, which competed against 30,000 um, students throughout the, this country, um, came up with a, a business where she, um, she, her mom had worked at Starbucks and she had seen day after day these piles of garbage of sugar packets. Um, and she said, this is really absurd. Um, why are we creating this garbage right in front of our eyes? So she patented a solution, um, which is sugar wrapped in rice, dissolvable rice paper, patented a container which it can be drawn from, and it's now being tried in 150 coffee shops around the country. Um, another young man who at 15 actually figured out how to um, retune cars that were running on diesel fuel to vegetable oil, and you know has worked on 600 vehicles, um, and he's 15 years old. Um, we have um, another young woman who was a winner recently who figured out the, um, if anybody used henna in your hair, it's a, you know, it's a hair color that only comes, it's a natural vegetable dye that's only available in one color. And she figured out how to change the pH so that it could be available in a number of different shades and people could have organic, healthy hair color. So, you know, our thesis here is that we have to, you know, reach young people earlier. We have to get them to be thinking entrepreneurially, whether or not they're competing for one of these few jobs that are going to be out there, um, whether they're working in companies of less than 30, which, you know, there's no HR people, you have to be entrepreneurial, and, or whether they're creating their own business. Really, really important stuff. If you talk to, um, I just had, the, um, had a conversation the other day with the chairman of Hilton, hotels worldwide, owns all the hotels in, with, under the Hilton brand. And he said his biggest business challenge was finding um, entry-level employees in emerging economies. And in that business, if you enter um, at, a re at a low level, you have a good opportunity to go through management. Because they weren't people who were thinking entrepreneurially who actually understood enough about the work life to actually think in that way. Um, the, the last point that I just want to make before I'll um, take a minute to answer the, uh, the question is, you know, we have to really work hard in spreading this message that economic growth and green initiatives are in conflict. I mean, in the UN, in the U.S. alone, um, I think in 2010, it, um, the, it's documented that green jobs created 2.7 more million jobs here many of them well-paid and low-skilled, which is what is um, necessary for many of the people on the bottom of the pole here. Um, so the, your generation is already thinking that way. My generation gets stuck 
um, and thinking that to talk about green means to talk about hurting the economy and hurting um, the employment rates at a time where it's not necessary, which is absolutely not the case. Call to action for the UN. Our model is, um, you know, we think it's really important to teach teachers how to do this. Teachers, by definition, are often not entrepreneurial thinkers. They're often, you know, attracted to that profession because it's a stable job, it's a government job, et cetera. But they also are natural entrepreneurs. So we can train teachers to actually think this way, to teach this, um, to teach this content. We can change the world, and we can build capacity in countries all over the world. So. To build sustainable capacity, I would suggest that the first thing the UN can do is commit to um, training 50,000 teachers around the world. Not, you know, for the UN, pretty easy, pretty reasonable thing to do. They should be able to do it in the next six months. Two, um, lead the um, creation of digital learning environment because part of the way that you know young people learn is um, is the opposite of what we're doing for you here today, which is talking at you. You know, we have to create digital games, we have to create digital content, we have to make it interactive. We take every young person um, to a wholesale market and have them do a buying experience. We have them walk through their neighborhoods um, to look for opportunities um, that would actually build capacity for their neighborhoods. All of these things can be done on a much larger scale if we build the technology tools to do it, and that's something that the UN can convene people and get um, a commitment to do it. And thirdly, and I would say almost the most important thing, and as influential as the UN is, um, you know, is and the wide reach, is to mobilize a core of volunteers to work with young people on this entrepreneurial thought. When young people live in communities where they have such a limited view of opportunity, the best thing that we can do is put success in front of them so they can begin to see what opportunities look like, so we can begin to see you know, how many jobs and how many ideas come into making your mobile phone um, or, or any other um, thing that is um, that young people are currently obsessed with. So those would be my three call to action. Good answers. Thank you so much. I have to say that one of the major programs picking up on your last point of Peace Child International is peer-to-peer -peer training, which emerged from a survey done by a World Bank youth team at Rio Plus 20. It emerged that peer training is the policy that they wanted governments to push most, and this idea of mobilizing a core of uh, young volunteers was actually in the speech that uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon made on January 25th last year when he announced the appointment of this uh, special envoy. So that idea is certainly one that I think you should think some more about. But let's hear from Thomas Christensen about the uh, Partnerships Division of the United Nations and what kinds of partnerships, Thomas, can you think about to support young people to do this? Is there a mic? There is a mic. Um, I, I get tired of sitting down and I'm sure that all of you also get tired of looking at us sitting up here. So I'll go down here. I am working with the UN Secretary General in trying to establish ways and means of the UN to partner with non-governmental actors, that is, private sector, financial institutions, civil society, philanthropy, and so on. Um, the UN is an organization that is now more than 65 years old, but actually it's set up by governments, run by governments, for governments. And um, the Secretary General has taken upon himself, he's just been reappointed for a second five-year period to try to help member states change that way of working so that the UN is more in tune with the 21st century, so to speak. Um, but, but before I dive into that, I would actually like to pick up on Amy's point and just ask all of you, can we see a raise of hands? How, how many believe that there is actually a green transition of the global economy happening as we speak? Mm. Um, how many of you believe that you can make money, that there is an economic opportunity in investing in and being entrepreneurs in the green space? Well, since you are at a green biz event, I would have hoped to see more hands. Um, how many of you then believe that one of the major obstacles to having a green transition is the UN? And how many believe that the major obstacle is your government? That was a good show of hands. I like that. Now, I come 
before I joined the Secretary General, I worked for the government of Denmark. I was not part of the team hosting the Copenhagen, the Copenhagen fiasco, as David put it. Uh, but I have been part of a team working with the Danish government trying to figure out how to keep on the global agenda the notion that you can actually grow your economy while you go green. Because, my friends, one of the reasons why Copenhagen failed and why climate negotiations will keep on failing is because most of your governments, develop, developing north, south, east, west, most of them don't believe that it is possible to grow your economy while you lower carbon emissions and have a more sustainable use of your natural resources. If they did believe it, you would all have raised your hand and say we are in a green transition, and you would all be raising your hand and saying this is a way to make money. The simple fact is they don't. And we are being asked here by David to tell you what the UN can do for you. But I would actually send you home to where you come from with a task from us, which is talk to your governments, talk to your politicians, talk to your business associations. Be part of the peer pressure on us, on the UN, on, on the world, to enable us to make the difficult decisions that are necessary for making the green transition happen. There was a young Indian entrepreneur up here in the panel before who talked about the opportunities of going green. And I, there were several in that panel who talked about energy efficiency and so on. The fact is that if you look at the timelines going towards your future, they look pretty bleak. Um, in Copenhagen, there was actually an agreement on setting a two-degree target for for the Celsius target for temperature increases. Well, my friends, the way global energy production and consumption is going, we are locked in to two degrees in three years from now. And then two degrees is inevitable. And what we're actually on a pathway towards is more towards 4.5 degrees to 6 degrees scenario, which means that by the time you're my age and you have your own children, they'll be looking at a very different world where Extreme weather, storms, droughts, fires, etc., uh, etc., et will, will be much more prevalent. That is a, a risk, but I think it also is a great opportunity, actually, for those of you who make green business to find the opportunity in creating new and better solutions for energy, for water, for food, nutrition. And so, if I should answer, what can the UN do for you? Well, what we can do for you is to inspire you, to set goals, to set targets for the future. Um, it's to define the space you are active in. But the ones who can craft the solutions in how we actually address these challenges, that's you. And that's where we need you. We need your talent, your motivation, your thinking, and your entrepreneurship. Um, and I can only encourage you to go home and, and, and really think about what you can do to also help, help us in doing so. That would be my main message to you. Number one, we can inspire you, we can set goals, we can help organize you, we can do all the nice things the ILO and the Global Compact are doing. But in reverse, you have to work with us in finding the solutions and in inspiring your own government and, and, and business uh, associations and in really working on finding the business models that show that the green transition is possible. The work I do with the Secretary General on partnership is then to enable us as an organization to be able to, to capture and, and bring on board the energy and the innovation and the thinking that you're generating. We have a huge partnership that is running now on energy that has a, one of its goals to create energy access for more than one billion people in the world. It's also trying to drive energy efficiency and renewable energy. Um, we have another partnership that works on maternal health care and, and, and child health. And there are many more potentials out there where we can bring both the UN system, countries, capital, finance, and technology together to try to drive change. But it really gets back to having people like you who also believe that it's possible. So with that, uh, thank you very much and good luck. Uh, I was only joking when I said that the UN can't do anything. The one thing that the UN is doing, which is fabulous, is sustainable energy for all by the year 2030. And that is an initiative led by uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and is unbelievable. It's raised billions, trillions of dollars almost already. And that is the kind of challenge that uh, really we can take home. And as, as Thomas says, 
it is our job to knock heads together in our own governments and get them to send uh, decisions here to New York, to the United Nations. Because although it says at the beginning of the preamble, we the peoples, this organization is actually we the governments. Um, yeah. We have to persuade our governments to take the right decisions uh, because a lot of us, most of us, elect them. Finally, I want to introduce uh, a gentleman who's been an old time and fantastic friend to, to Peace Child, a legend in his own time here at the United Nations, was the regional director for North America for the UN Environment Program, but his influence has rippled far beyond that. He's now the president of the Friends of the United Nations. And Noel, it couldn't be a great pleasure to introduce you and hear what you think the UN can do to, to support and partner with young people to make them young green entrepreneurs. No Brown. Well, thank, thank you very much, David. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let me say it's a, it's a very distinct pleasure to be here this morning, to be in your company. I had hoped that I would be able to listen to you, you will. and the kind of inputs <laughs> that you would be able to, pro to provide us, because too often we have been, we have mastered the art of talking past each other. And my hope is that we can develop a real dialogue with young people so that uh, you're able to give us a sense of your hopes and dreams, critique us when we have failed, and more importantly, build partnerships with us. I have spent half my life and all my career at United Nations. It's an organization I know quite well. I know its strengths, its weaknesses, and its promises. I know there are times when people get very despairing about the organization, but don't write it off. It's a very resilient entity, and it's nourished continuously by the generations, by the insights, and by the passion and commitment of young people. By people like you sitting here, it's not important what I say or what the panel says, but as you frame your own thoughts and ideas, you'll ask yourself, what can we do to build a stronger United Nations? How can we, the successor generation, because we had made commitments to your generation, become partners with the United Nations. I myself think the UN is ready. I think it's a more open place, a more accessible place, and a more encouraging place. And I know it's very difficult sometimes to get a response. Sometimes we seem indifferent. We are a little bit uh, condescending. But basically, we're a sound organization. Very soundly conceived, and for more than six decades, continuously nourished. And the nourishment that is most important is the energy insights, passion and compassion that you, the young, can provide for the United Nations. I'm rather intrigued by the theme today and why we're looking at different dimensions where young people may be involved in the organization and where young people may lead. Years ago, I created something called the Young Entrepreneurs Forum. It's still active, it's now located in Halifax, Nova Scotia. But the idea was to see how can we clean up the concept of business as something ignoble. <coughs> and we'd rather be philosophers than businessmen. And so consequently, I believe the idea is coming across that your generation, with the kind of ethic that you practice and you can bring to the organization, <laughs> will make not the world not only better, but make business much more responsive and much more responsible for building and shaping a sustainable future. Bureaucrats can't do it alone. We strut around the world and we make policies, but I think by building effective partnerships with you, the young, I think we're much better, much stronger, and much dur more durable organization. So David, I just wanted to thank you for taking the initiative and to add my voice in welcome these young people. I hope we can start a conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Noel. So, this is where life gets difficult, but because uh, this room is not easily uh, set up to break down into small groups. But we have the um, three, four young entrepreneurs that you saw on the table, uh, on the panel here this morning, and we have are uh, five, six panelists. So we can split into ten groups. Um, is that right? Is my math correct? We have five up here. We have five of us. So that is ten. So what I, what I would like you to do is to, we 
will spread out and take these brown chairs, which are movable, the gray chairs are not, and set up a circle there, a circle in the back of the room there, in the corner there, and in the corner down here. We'll have one group up here. That makes five. And then what I'd like you to do is to have, to, so you can move to those places, and I will place Noel over there, uh, Thomas in that far corner there, yes? Amy over there in the far right. I hope that's not your politics, but be there anyway. And then Jed down here. And then um, Vincius, if you could gather in, go into the middle of the room there, and just gather around him so that you can tell these people what your answers to these questions, your, your ideas are, and then at the end of the session, they will come back up here and tell you what they've learned. Because as Noel says, we want to learn from you. So, um, Chris, Ravi, will you take the group in the middle here, and Ravi, will you go there in the middle, and move there now so that people can see where you are and, and gather around you. Alina, could you take a group at the back of the hall, right at the very back in the middle there, yeah? And Katya, you go and work with, uh, with Alina there so the two of you can manage that group, okay? So, if uh, I'll stay up here, and I, we've got a nice sort of 10, 10 group here. And would you like to each go to your corners and then you guys just go and gather around the person that you most want to speak to and tell them your ideas and ask them your questions. And in that way, instead of one or two questions coming from the hall, everyone in this room will get to speak. Is that clear? I didn't hear you. Is that clear? Yes. 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 Are you sure that's clear? Yes. Okay, panel move and we'll be back here. Uh, in about 25 minutes to report back, all right? So, no, Thomas, Amy in the far corner here. Yeah, you're in the middle there. I'm up here. Don't leave me all on my own. Come on, guys, on your feet. On your feet and move. Which way? Yes. Pull up a chair. No. Um, get, 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 get the gentleman a chair. Come on, look after your uh, elder station of you out here. Yeah, they, you can sit on the back of tables. Where are you, uh, Vincent? You're in this corner? So come on, join Vincent here. Okay, gather around here, yeah? Where are you going to go? She's horrible. Oh, <laughs> Robbie, <where are> you? <laughs> okay, so uh, let's just pull up a chair around the you'll get to sit, I'll sit on the floor if you like. That's <laughs> Ravi, where are you going to be? Okay, are you, have you got a group there? What you could, uh, yeah. uh, do try and spread around so that not uh, a thousand people with one group and uh, 20 with uh, 10 with the others, yeah? Spread out, sit on the back of the tables. This is how we have a conversation at the UN. Are you cool, Chris? Anyone want to join me up here? Oh, how mean you are. Come and join us up here.
25 minutes, guys, okay? Hi, uh, my name is Maya Davis. I'm American. I am a junior biochemistry major at Hampton University in Hampton, Virginia. Um, we actually came here. We were counselors. Um, our group of counselors were the Young Diplomats Program, which is a summer program held um, at Hampton University. And we came to the United Nations Youth Assembly to get ideas about what youth is, what youth is doing and how you can become a leader and just learn from this assembly what we can take back to the city. And I'm with her, and I'm Amber Riddish, and I go to St. school, but I'm a psychology major. I'm graduating this year, hopefully going to grad school. So. I have a question for you then. Is sustainability to you, is it the environment? Or is it something else? And if it's something else, can you tell me what it is? I'm, I'm curious what this term means to you because I think it means different things to different people in different places at, at different times. Um, well, I think sustainability does apply to the environment, but it applies to humanity. Because honestly, the only reason why we look for different solutions and different ways to better the environment and better the community is so that we can better ourselves as human beings and so that we can make the world a safer place for us. So I feel like sustainability goes for, it goes to, it really applies to humanity in the end. Like, you can sustain the environment in order to sustain our culture and sustain who we are as people. So, so in addition to,
So our work in, in our office is working with universities, with business schools particularly. So it's not like any one of you are taking classes in anybody else's day. Management classes have been taken in sort of class, business, business class. Why not resume? You're the business, okay? Was there any discussion of, of these sort of things of not a business major, but I'm a chemistry major, and we talk about sustainability in the ways of how do you create new projects, how do you new products, like um, new technologies, it would be more the biotechnology, like when we're talking about the biofuels, um, you sit there and understand like what you break it down in the cell to make it so where it's cleaner when it comes out in the um, and you use it, like, but we don't talk about sustainability in the sense of business, we talk about it in the sense of how you generate it and how you put it out there. So like the resources that you're using to So again, so that's just to tell you a little more about the work that we do. It's kind of involved in that space. So we look at the things that we do is to incorporate sustainability, so there's environmental aspects of sustainability, chemistry courses.
Okay, guys, we need to... Thank you for engaging us. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, all good things must come to an end. So get back to your chairs, and if we could ask the panelists to come up here as quickly as possible. We have another event starting in about 10 minutes. Hello, Byron. Hello, Byron. Can you get the mic working, please? Dr. Brown. Dr. Brown, to the platform, please.
Okay, so the point here is just to very briefly feed back to you what uh, came up um, and in each of our groups, and really only a minute because uh, we, we need to move to our other session. And I had a wonderful little group from New Jersey up here on the platform, and they wanted the UN to create internships and also a platform where they could learn about uh, things like what Ravi is doing in India without having to go all the way to India, but if they could learn more about what other young people are doing in other parts of the world, then they would like to be able to travel out and share and do the kind of things that I think this uh, UN Youth Volunteers program might be able to achieve. So that was my group. Jeff, yeah, what did your group do? We discussed seizing leadership opportunities, taking advantage of leadership opportunities, and, and trying to build relationships within organizations, but also outside of organizations. We also talked about the need and the, the value for, for partnerships and you know, with other organizations that have different sorts of strengths. Uh, in terms of the leaders we want to be and that we hope we'll see in the future, these are people who are able to speak to different groups who uh, Know, understand the, the nature of different sorts of organizations and, and the differences between disciplines. So to have scientists that can speak about the environment, but then can also do so in a way that they show an understanding of social issues too. Uh, because we know that sustainability challenges actually go beyond the environment. And they include uh, you know, social things related to, to people, climate change being one of them. Uh, an issue that is related to the environment, but it also depends on how people interact with each other. Uh, and through doing this, we think there'll be an opportunity for building long-term healthy communities. Great, thank you. Vincent. Yeah, it was a very, very nice uh, conversation with my colleagues from Haiti, in Nigeria, and Japan. It was a very small group. Uh, and we, um, actually, we, we, we discussed that uh, UN could support, in the case of AT, uh, building and uh, the reconstruction, and to make sure that uh, 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 the reconstruction process goes in a sustainable way in terms of uh, using the use of the materials and also on, in terms of occupational safety and health. Uh, they also said that the food sector is also important. I mean, they need the investment uh, in terms of uh, sustainable agriculture. Um, Nigeria, the colleague from Nigeria, she raised the point uh, on investment in terms of uh, uh, secondary schools, you know, to make sure people in secondary schools uh, got information. Um, also, uh, for Nancy, we got uh, the need to involve uh, the youth in the discussion, the participation in the process, uh, to, to, to assess the, the, what they need and what are the, the, the possible solutions. Uh, creativity was one of the points um, to stimulate, to untap all this uh, innovations and, uh, uh, that are coming together with the youth generation, so this is a, 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 an important point. Uh, and finally, from Japan, we got, uh, 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 it's a country that has invested a lot in environment uh, and, and has shown that it's important to have invested in infrastructure. I mean, we don't turn to green just by good intentions, but it's important to catalyze channel resources to infrastructure, to green infrastructure, then to uh, then boost uh, 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 the investment in other areas. And just to, 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 to finalize, uh, then I got this uh, request from my colleague from Haiti. They said, okay, I want to come back to Haiti and open and start a business on recycling. So how can you even, uh, help me? Uh, so who should I uh, search? Who should I, uh, mean? Uh, well, what should I do? Uh, then of course I got this card, this contact with this. <laughs> and uh, but of course, yeah, of course. I mean, the, we have a little project on uh, on youth, uh, a youth facility to, to promote youth entrepreneurship, and um, I'll put him in contact with our colleagues in Haiti to see how we can help him in terms of uh, startup uh, uh, business, in terms of uh, providing resources for startup business education, uh, training, and, uh, and, and other issues. All right, hello everyone. We had a great group of youth um, from various parts, uh, Georgia, the United States, India, Haiti, China, and, and others, 
Um, one of the major things we, we, we spoke about was the need to address the issues that we're all facing at the individual level. The importance of us, um, aside from technological innovation, aside from, from all of these major things, we really need to care about the values and, and address the values that um, each one of us find important and, and really incorporate those in our lives. Um, another thing we, we saw is the need for the United Nations to help create partnerships um, and sharing of best practices, and I think that's kind of a, a common theme here um, that a lot of us are, are trying to address. So the ability to create a platform for us to, you know, network and share innovations in energy and in, in waste recycling and others. And so, um, so that was major. And uh, finally, just uh, the need for, for us to, again, work together and, um, and, and create solutions uh, at our local level, and I think that that was really the bulk of, uh, of our discussion, aside from also addressing uh, the nexus between developed and developing countries and how we can actually help both of us address these challenges um, together, uh, because obviously there's, there's various different issues that you know, we're both facing. So that was kind of a, a wraparound. Thanks. Thank you. I wish we had another hour or two because I think we could have created about six different businesses. Um, but I, it, you know what? The biggest takeaway um, was I think that you know we um, young people from Georgia, Honduras, Haiti, China, um, various places in the U.S. Um, was that as as much as everybody felt as if they were already global citizens of the world, their unique um, their their the places where they came from had their unique challenges. And we shouldn't assume that, you know, even though information technology is falling globally, that, um, that there's one answer that's going to fit all different cultures. So the young women from Georgia were talking about the lack of knowledge in Georgia, um, the lack of awareness around green and environmentally sensitive issues. This is not talked about in school. It's not talked about in families. So from an information point of view, um, you know, we have cultural challenges. We should not assume all, you know, all young people and all millennials actually um, have the information they need. Um, really interesting conversation about elders, particularly in the Latino community, and um, the resistance to risk. And, uh, which is related to trying new ideas and doing things differently. Um, and in the from the Latino community of, um, you know, the need for acceptance by their elders, yet um, some of the things that we're talking about trying to do are new and foreign to them, and they're not going to communicate through social media and through tweeting, et cetera. So how do we reach them and how do we grow capacity? And that, I think, is an interesting um, is an interesting discussion for the UN itself um, in terms of spreading um, capacity and discussion around that, um, and um, basically, you know, not surprising but disappointed um, for me. Uh, passion, ideas, particularly the group from Haiti, others who actually are ready and want to be entrepreneurs, want their children to be entrepreneurs and are overwhelmed by the idea because they don't have the information in front of them. They don't know how to test you know, opportunities on the internet. There's so many easy tools that could be available and spread by the UN that could get people out of the, um, out of the um, thinking that how am I going to learn how to do this versus how do I start doing it. Thomas. In, uh in our group, we, we also had a, a wide range of, of people from uh, Haiti, Nigeria, Japan, South Korea, the U.S., Georgia, and if anybody feels out, I'm sorry. Uh, but but, but I, I think uh, many people in that group were here to learn more about the U.N., um, about each other. There was a, many people mentioned the MDGs, Millennium Development Goals, and, and the um, interest in, in, in helping bring those forward. Uh, we also talked a bit about that there is a process uh, ongoing here at the UN of defining the next set of goals uh, for 2030 the, um, and, and, and that there might be a great opportunity for youth to engage in both defining the goals but then also because really that's about your own future 2030 uh, defining solutions for achieving those goals in, including through entrepreneurship. There were, there were, the comment was made that, that uh, just the exchange this morning, and I'm sure what you will also hear when we are leaving the podium, 
the awareness about climate and climate issues uh, was important and, and, and was a take home from here. And I guess that reflects also some of the comments made by, by, by others here in the panel. And then finally, there was one, one uh, delegation almost with five members in, in our group that spoke passionately about, about the need to help find ideas and solutions for uh, internally displaced people. A particular concern maybe for that country, but also something that has a more global reach. And I think youth getting engaged in helping displaced people is also a very good cause. I'm not sure I can see the entrepreneurial angle on that, but then again, I'm not a business person. Probably there's a good entrepreneurial <laughs> angle to it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hello everyone, my name is Dan Colbiello and I'd like to thank my facilitator for putting uh, words into action and um, appointing me as the repertoire, uh, giving me the opportunity to discuss what was uh, spoken about in our group. In our group, we, we had people from Mexico, Gambia, Georgia, Canada, Vietnam, Bangladesh, and the U.S. Very diverse perspectives, um, all bringing different um, viable uh, ideas to the table. Now, there were two main questions that we spoke about in our meeting, and that was, how do we um, address the challenges of the post-2015 agenda, and how can youth be uh, involved in that process more? We've learned about it throughout this conference a little bit. Uh, the second question is, how do we support business development um, for youth leaders? Now, we had a long conversation about it, but I'm going to uh, summarize it in five key points or a framework. We primarily talk about a framework of how to address these problems. The first uh, would be community voice, uh, finding out what the needs of the community are uh, and increasing a collaborative network between young people, essentially an international exchange. The second thing is orientation. Now that we have these people communicating with each other, you need to gain a sense of uh, trust understanding um, of not only the organization that you're working with, but uh, that organization should know a little bit about you. Uh, the third is meaningful action. Um, meaningful action is you know, putting your money where your mouth is and um, actually participate in service, conducting those training programs to uh, advance youth uh, and, and their skills. The last two is um, reflection and evaluation. Uh, evaluating is key. Thank you. Thank you very much. One more group. I have to say that I really, really love my group. They were people from all around the world. Some hands here? Uh -huh. Okay, okay. So really nice people. And they told me uh, it would be really, really nice if uh, I could be able to say UN looked at my project. So maybe if UN could like gather more projects that really worked and uh, bring this credit to the project would be great. Um, uh, then again, uh, a guy told me, you know, this thing with green economy sounds a bit romantic. Uh, so if you, if you went, could help us persuade, like uh, decision makers or people in general, to bring awareness would be just great. And one more idea. I mean, people and uh, youth are full of ideas, but what about testing those ideas? Maybe we can find some way to test these kind of ideas with the help of the U.S. Ladies and gentlemen, we started 20 minutes late. We've made up 10 minutes. I'm sorry we're running 10 minutes late. But now what's happening is there's going to be uh, a reception where we present the book to the uh, representative of the government of Denmark that have been supporting the EGBIS uh, initiative. So if you want to stay, please do. But right now, I'd like to thank all the members of our panel. Thomas, Dr. Brown, Vincent, for a really interesting session. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah, listen up. This is your own. It's the only one you got. It's supposed to pay, but you can't let them. You can't even get them. So I repeat, this is your own. It's the only one you got. Cherish it, protect it. It's the only one you're going to get. These guys, they're your neighbors. They ain't going away. They ain't leaving. You have to get along with them. So you have to learn to share. You have to get along. You have to learn to get along. 
because they are your neighbors, they're not going away. Okay, all this stuff, the animals, the waters, the sky, the ground, the bugs, the fish, the tacos, the people, 